1962, John Betjeman toured the West Country making five short films of its most appealing towns. For 30 years, these films were considered lost, but now we're able to see them again. Two of them intact, and three of them reconstructed using Betjeman's own scripts. My name's Nigel Hawthorne. Join me in Betjeman Revisited. John Betjeman died over ten years ago, but he's still probably Britain's best-loved poet. Once, when he was asked what he wanted most, he replied to make people look at beautiful things, particularly beautiful buildings. In these films of the West Country towns, I think perhaps that Betjeman's enthusiasm for buildings shines down the 30-odd years since they were last shown. This is how an audience, in the summer of 1962, would have been introduced to John Betjeman, not yet knighted, not yet poet laureate. John Betjeman cannot be separated from that straw shopping bag which he always carries. It contains railway timetables, large-scale maps and old guidebooks, among many other things. Armed with these works of reference, he approaches a town, a county, a city, to try and discover the reasons why they grew up and the people who gave them substance in their growing. He is a sort of social detective, and the clues he follows are the buildings, the monuments, and the highways left by older generations. When you understand the past, he says, the confusion of the present becomes a good deal clearer. Tonight, John Betjeman investigates the life of a Wiltshire county town, the town of Devizes. Oh, and I forgot this. The Bear Hotel in the marketplace, a relic of coaching days. Look at that ironwork about 1800, I should think, and then follow along to the older part. Sir Thomas Lawrence, the portrait painter, was born here. His father was the innkeeper. I like that great fat lettering across the front. Made in 1962, when Betjeman was at the height of his powers, they were presumed lost, but fortunately they still exist, some complete, Others have been restored using the original film and Betjeman's original words, which I shall be speaking. Betjeman loved these old market towns and Devizes has stood the test of time rather well. The indoor and outdoor marketplaces remain and still hold markets every week. The fine timber houses have been restored and no madness has swept the town's Georgian streets away. The assize courts, devises assizes, are empty and run down. Saddle stones have made way for concrete garages. But Betjeman would be delighted to know that the derelict and rotting Kennedon Avon Canal, England's most beautiful waterway as he called it, has been brought back to life. In 1962, Betjeman crisscrossed the West Country in his little Mini, often driving too fast. He delighted in historic towns like Sherborne. Sherborne with its abbey and seemingly countless schools, boarding schools and day schools. He felt a deep subconscious sense of history in the brown ironstone buildings and delighted in the treasures hidden by these impressive facades. Like this painting by Sir James Thornhill, who painted the inside of the dome of St Paul's Cathedral. still here, though the building now houses the Sherborne Art Centre.
When he was researching a town, Betjeman had a very clear plan of campaign. He explains it all in this slim volume, which was published in 1943, after he'd returned from a two-year stint at the British Embassy in Dublin. He liked to start at the railway station, purchase a town guide, which would contain nothing but praise about everything in the place. Here we are. Really wet days are exceptional, and sports can be enjoyed at any season. He would survey the hotels, hotels he would call them. The family owned ones were best. He looked for lace curtains, a mahogany sideboard, and bottles of brown sauce. He'd then go and buy some postcards taken by local photographers which would guide him to the particular sites. These are some of Betjeman's own postcards taken at North Lewin, Devon. It's a very hard place to find, this once more important place. In fact, you can only discover it with the aid of a one-inch map and somebody sitting beside you in the car to read it. Benjamin was fascinated by deepest Devon with its mysterious silence. But with North Lou, it was more than this. Two centuries ago, North Lou had been a prosperous large village or small town. By Benjamin's time, it was still and near deserted. It had been killed off by the railway. The railway had bypassed the town. Trade had gone elsewhere. Listen to the warning note in the valley two miles away. The note that emptied the market square. From a place the railways cut short to a place the railways made great. From the London and South Western in North Devon to its rival, the Great Western at Swindon. Swindon in the early 60s was all railways, steam of course, engineering and post-war development. Betjeman, tongue firmly in cheek, described Swindon as a lot of buildings and very little architecture. But he could still show us some real treats. The railway village with its simple but elegant terraces. Cricklaid House, built in 1729, and one of the most distinguished townhouses in Wiltshire, and the other delights of the old town. Traffic changes everything. First the railways, then the motor car, but it hasn't changed old Swindon. I don't know what progress is, but if it hadn't been for modern planners, we wouldn't have had this oasis of quiet this bit of real Wiltshire, an old country town, preserved and alive, thank God, in the biggest borough in the county. Times have changed, and Swindon has changed more than most. The estates for the newcomers from London have reached middle age. The railway works have gone, and although there are still plenty of buildings, architecture has reared its ugly head. Traffic and the motorist were a particular worry for Betjeman as far back as 1943. He thought the constant pressure of traffic, the widening and straightening of streets, would speed the destruction of our old and natural towns. He feared for Chippenham. Modern traffic hates the pedestrian. It stinks, it shouts, it kills. I wonder what it's going to do to that bit of Tudor Chippenham in the high street. I hardly need to ask. Modern traffic is driving even the borough council out of these Georgian storehouses it occupies in the middle of the town. That's going. Well, the Georgian storehouses did go. And the fine house, replaced by Woolworths, has been replaced by an even larger Woolworths. However, St. Mary's Street, which Betjeman called the prettiest street in England, is still, and he'd be delighted, St. Mary's Street. We 
finish our short trip to the West Country in Sidmouth, sunny Sidmouth. Benjamin loved Sidmouth, and in fact, this is the only film in his series which was in verse. Older and more exclusive than Torquay, Sidmouth in Devon, you're the town for me. Not perhaps brilliant poetry, but it was Benjamin having fun. He loved this place. He loved the Regency architecture, he loved the sea air, and imagined conversations. And on the front, as Sidmouth tea time ends, there's always such a chance of meeting friends. Uncle and Auntie Gladys, what a treat. So this is Terence, doesn't he look sweet? Well, weren't us lucky, all of us, to meet. As the waves thunder on the shingle shore, the wife and I lie back and have a snore. In 1943, Betjeman made a plea to save the beauty of our small English towns. He wasn't too much worried about what happened to the German bombers. He was much more concerned about what he called over-enthusiastic post-war reconstruction. And for the next 40 years until his death, he campaigned probably more than anybody to preserve the best of what was old. He campaigned for churches, for monuments, for railways, for piers. And he wrote articles and books and in this series, he appealed through television, through the telly. And he made many friends through his enthusiasm and his wisdom and his sense of humor. I very much enjoyed making these films and helping to restore some of these old Betjeman prints and hope very much that you've enjoyed them too. How long has man been civilized? For thousands of years before Christ. Silbury Hill on the Wiltshire Downs, the biggest prehistoric earthwork in Europe. No one knows what it was for, when it was made, and who lies under it. And what strange rites went on nearby, here at Avery? No one knows. This was the chief temple of Northern Europe three to four thousand years ago. But we do know that the Bronze Age people who worshipped here, long before Druids were thought of, were a peaceful people, highly organized, and who made beautiful pottery. We know too that they shaped these stones and moved them by rolling them on logs from a distant valley, and they probably built that ditch which surrounds Avery to keep out the evil spirits of the dead from escaping out into the open downland where the living people farmed. And when the Bronze Age people looked down over the edge of these downs 4,000 years ago, notice the ridges of early cultivation, all they saw below them was thick forest and impenetrable swamp and where are now West Wiltshire's fields and dairy farms. Skip 2,000 years to only 1,000 years ago when the Normans built a castle here at Devizes on the edge of Saxon Wessex to patrol the forest. More impressive, I think, than its Victorian mock ancient turrets is the genuine Norman tower there of St. John's Church. I think a church is a very good place and a Norman church like this one, look at its east end, from which to start out on a tour of this too little regarded Wiltshire-sized town of Devizes. And by the way, always look down alleys if you want to find the real history of a town. I mean, look at those half-timbered houses, built before brick was used, and when stone was so rare, it was only used for castles and churches. I should think that's 15th century, late 15th. And then notice that splendid altar tomb surrounded by railings in the churchyard there, mid-Georgian from the look of it. Now I wonder where he lived, who lies under there. Across the road, in that house? Probably not. He was dead before that. And this house, I should think, is about 1790. 
It's a Devizes version of the Adam style, with ionic capitals to the porch. And ironwork balconies that remind me of Exeter and the West Country, which isn't far off. Yes, that street's mostly Georgian, built at a time when it was fashionable to hide the roofs of houses behind a brick parapet. Anything from 1800 and later. And there's an earlier house where the roof shows. Look at that rainwater head. Come closer. The grand and old houses of Devizes belonging to the merchants and lawyers are in the middle of the town. Humbler ones are on the outskirts. We might here be in a Wiltshire village with a green in front of the houses and a pond and another Devizes church reflected in it, St. James's. I hope you don't mind all this detective work I'm doing, but it really makes any town interesting, especially one as old as Devizes. Look at those staddle stones, doing what they're meant to do, keeping a shed above rat level. And go down that alley and enter the marketplace, a perfect marketplace for a Wiltshire country town. Potton, Seen, Bishop's Cannings, Lavington, where have you come from? You with your produce. And did you come from Leeds? In the middle of the marketplace, there's a monument. And really, you must listen to the awful tale recorded on it. On this spot, Ruth Pierce of Potton in 1753, withheld some money she owed for wheat. When asked if she'd paid, she said she wished she might drop down dead if she had not. She rashly repeated this awful wish, when to the consternation and terror of the surrounding multitude, she instantly fell down and expired, having the money concealed in her hand. Think of that and walk into the covered market. There's no need for me to talk here. Just have a look round. Go on reading, we won't disturb you. That's the old town hall, which they used to sell cheese under when the ground floor was open to the street. And there's the new town hall at the end of the street, built by Baldwin of Bath in 1808 and with a splendid assembly room on the first floor. The Assize Courts, 1835, Devises the sizes, the county town. And down the road, that's where the Wiltshire Constabulary hang out. And here's the barracks, Victorian of course, and very military looking. Once headquarters of the Wiltshire Regiment, and now the TA. Oh, and I forgot this. The Bear Hotel in the marketplace, a relic of coaching days. Look at that ironwork about 1800, I should think. And then follow along to the older part. Sir Thomas Lawrence, the portrait painter, was born here. His father was the innkeeper. I like that great cat lettering across the front. And next to the bear, there's the corn exchange, 1858. With the arms of devices on the top, a Norman castle to remind you it's an old borough. And now prepare for the unexpected. Devizes hides 
one of the great engineering triumphs of the world, the Kennet and Avon Canal, built 1794 to 1810. 29 locks descend here from the chalk downs into the Cheese Valley. It was made partly to protect England against France and to ensure an inland route from Bristol to London in case the French seized the English Channel. The railways destroyed the canal trade and ignored devices and chose Swindon instead. Look at it now. England's most wonderful waterway, forgotten and neglected. Do you remember Avebury? How long has man been civilized? Over 30 years ago, John Betjeman made five films on West Country towns. Until recently, these films were considered lost, but we've been able to recreate Betjeman's film on Chippenham and Krukan using his original script and the original negative. In it, he talks about the growing threat of traffic in our towns. But first, a short film made in 1962 about railways, Swindon, and North Lee. John Betjeman lives in three places. He has rooms in the city of London, a house in Berkshire and a cottage in Cornwall. But it is very difficult to find him in any of them. He is always somewhere in between, looking for old books, rare prints and forgotten railway stations. Long ago, he was told about the seven wonders of the world and how to reach them, but he took these directions more or less for granted and spent his time instead exploring side turnings off the main road, the lanes and the alleyways. He is a pioneer in the field of the neglected, the obscure and the unexpected. Tonight, John Betjeman makes a journey which begins in the lost town of North Loo in Devon and ends in Swindon. Traffic changes everything, except cows, which never take any notice of traffic. Wise creatures. Traffic changes everything. Let's go back in this remote part of North Devon, to the age before railways, to the time of carts. Where are these old lanes leading? Each comes a cart's distance from some farm or hamlet to one secret hidden village. They're all leading to North Loo, which was once marked quite big on the old maps of Devon. It's a very hard place to find, this once more important place. In fact, you can only discover it with the aid of a one-inch map and somebody sitting beside you in the car to read it. Is it all deserted? No, but we don't want too many strangers' feet on these old causeways. North Loo was once a marketplace to which all the many local lanes led. And like all old English marketplaces, it has a market cross there on the left. And like all market crosses, the cross is near the parish church. And North Loo Church is full of that carved woodwork which is characteristic of the age of faith in Devon. When farms prospered, and wool sold well, and men gave their best, because everyone believed that Christ was God, to the grandest building in the parish. 
the church. You can easily imagine the inside of this church as it was in the 15th century. The last time it was extensively rebuilt, the windows full of red, yellow and silver stained glass, twinkling lights on the several altars, the smell of trodden new boughs rising from the floor, and the carved pews filled with people whose only dwellings were cob-walled, thatched hovels in lonely Devon with its white magic and mysterious silence. What did they know of the Reformation and politics when a visitor from as near as Oakhampton or Hatherley was an event to be talked of for a week? North Loo was once very nearly a town. First round that market cross, there wasn't, uh, and then there wasn't much room afterwards for the market and it spread out into the square. Imagine that space filled with stalls and cheap pens. There are still rings in the village where ponies and cobs were tethered. And it's still quite full on a fair day. Imagine the rich Devonian gossip that must have gone on round this parish pub. Why is North Loo so still and deserted today? For you can see it was once quite an important place. There's a Georgian shop front in what is now a private house. Bullseyes or stationery? What was sold there? Could you buy Doidge's annual with its folding colour plates of Dartmoor and tales in Devon dialect? And in that upper window, did they display crinolines and lace curtains or agricultural implements? Did toffee melt in the Devon sun amid groceries in this window? Quite a sizable house which a farmer built for himself near the square, so as to be on the spot for fair days. Early Victorian, I should think, from the look of it, and well proportioned. Oh, and chapels too. They were mostly built in the last century, when North Loo went on growing. One for Billy Bray, the Bible Christian revivalist from Cornwall. I don't say North Loo is decayed now. It just stays put in comfortable peace. Some people would say that the coming of the railway ruined North Loo. The London and South Western opened a line in the 90s from Oakhampton to Lanson. Traffic changes everything. Steam power displaced horses and drained the trade away. Listen to the warning note in the valley two miles away, the note that emptied the market square. From a place the railways cut short to a place the railways made great. From the London and South Western in North Devon to its rival, the Great Western at Swindon. There they are, the Swindon Works, where steam locomotives have been built for the Great Western since 1841. Between the North Star and the old broad gauge to County Class, the last to be made for the Great Western, between Daniel Gooch and Hawksworth, 
there's a long list of names that are thrilling to lovers of railways. In Swindon, it has always been an honour to be employed in the works, inside, as it's called in the town. Swindon ugly. I've come to love it because I know so many of its people. That's how the railway part of the town started, with shops, church, cricket ground, public gardens. And here survives what must be the first garden city in the world, built by the Great Western for its employees in 1841 out of stone taken from the box tunnel. They're still called the company's houses, each with its bit of garden in front and behind. There was once plenty of green space round the works, which were on the other side of the line. What was called New Swindon is a fascinating history of industrial England, an open book to you who have the eyes to see it. For as the town grew in prosperity and more people came, out of the flat Great Western Valley, up the hill, private speculators spilt their ribbons of houses. The richer you were, the higher you moved up the hill, until you attained an architect-designed home of your own, right at the top, I suppose, in the early thirties. Traffic changes everything. British railways killed the great western spirit, and a new spirit of planning was abroad, hygienic, high-minded, high-thinking. 20,000 workers from London were imported in the 50s to Swindon for new industries. You wouldn't know you were in Wiltshire. You wouldn't even know you were in Swindon. Nobody knows quite what is the right size for a newly planned town. Nobody knows whether the new community is going to mix with the one that's already there, and they don't seem to know quite where the shops ought to be. This place isn't a haphazard growth, like New Swindon of the railway was. It's sudden and deliberate, like a bomb. Swindon is already the biggest borough in Wiltshire, and it wants to expand more, but there aren't enough playing fields yet, it seems, for the children. Everything looks impersonal, though it's well meant. Is this Swindon? Is this? Is it anywhere? But here, at the top of the hill, is Wiltshire again. The distant downs, the smell of earth, the irregular shapes of the trees, the Wiltshire that Richard Jeffreys knew. 
and the country way of life. We are back where this film started, before the railway came, in the last century, before the new industries came, in this century, the market town of Swindon crowned its hill, that fine Georgian house. Traffic changes everything. First the railways, then the motor car, but it hasn't changed old Swindon. I don't know what progress is, but if it hadn't been for modern planners, we wouldn't have had this oasis of quiet, this bit of real Wiltshire, an old country town. Preserved and alive, thank God, in the biggest borough in the county. Old Swindon and North Loo, they've a lot in common. Modern motor traffic is no friend to an old town. Take Chippenham here. The road from London to Bath and Bristol thunders through it. At the top of the marketplace, there's the Bear Hotel, once the townhouse of a local landowner. There's just time, before we're run over, to look at the car Bear. And near it, there's the Yeld Hall, with the Butter Arms. Medieval. It looks rather a museum, he's now. Islanded in a sea of traffic. Can you hear me? Do you remember the bear? That's the view from it today. And here's the same view in about 1880. These are the sounds you would have heard as you look down the high street to the distant farms with their rich cheese and corn among the Wiltshire elms. There's the town bridge over the Avon, as it was till four years ago. Modern traffic takes its toll. And here it is today. Do you really think it's an improvement? There's a fine Georgian house which once stood in the high street. Modern traffic takes its toll. And there's the site today. When Brunel brought the Great Western Main Line through Chippenham, he designed it as a grand triumphal entry to the town. British railways see fit to deface it with hoarding. Modern traffic hates the pedestrian. It stinks, it shouts, it kills. I wonder what it's going to do to that bit of Tudor Chippenham in the high street. I hardly need to ask. Modern traffic is driving even the borough council out of these Georgian storehouses it occupies in the middle of the town. That's going. Modern traffic is draining Chippenham dry. This is the death of what once was River Street. The old houses have been destroyed to make a car park. I dare say the rest will go. I'm not a mad preservationist, 
but I hate to see the heart of an old town left to go to ruin. No one wants slums preserved, but thousands of old cottages, condemned and dead, could so easily be repaired and enlarged and made habitable. I dare say these could. Modern traffic hit Chippenham so hard, you would not know this was left behind. The Wiltshire Avon. Dead quiet. All the best things in England are hidden. Look at this range of old houses with gardens sloping down to the river bank. A beautiful old house in its own little park within yards only of the noise of the noisy marketplace. With an 18th century view, and Moncton House beyond, wisely saved from development by the borough. When the Avon was more used for traffic than it is now, uh, by the way, watch out for that tall Adam-style house appearing on the left between the trees, When the Avon was more used than it is now, this was the common slip by which the people of Chippenham walked up into what once used to be their High Street, now called St. Mary Street, and I think one of the prettiest streets in England. There's that Adam-style house I told you about. And now step up onto the churchyard wall and look across to those houses whose gardens we saw just now. Timber, brick, stone. Timber on the right, 17th century. Bricks and stone, 18th century. It's worth a closer look. It used to be the surgeon's home. Then the rectory, stone. And beyond it, a cottage such as you see in a Wiltshire village. A Wiltshire village lane. And so back to the High Street, at the end there. And the heavy traffic that has nearly killed, but not quite killed, Chippenham. Now, for another traffic-murdered town, Crewkern. It's a sort of Clapham junction of main roads in the Valley of the Parrot in Somerset. Local tradesmen still sometimes think heavy traffic brings business. It doesn't. It takes it away to larger places and makes the old streets smelly, noisy and dangerous and unfit to shop in. I never thought of looking at Kruker until this visit. I'm glad I stopped. You never know. Let's start at this yard at the chief hotel as visitors should, and go outside and explore Church Street, an old official street. And, ah, cloth mills. Krukern made sailcloth webbing and girths. Now it makes shirts. Weaving was its trade from Somerset wool. Davis's Arms Houses, 1707, built for poor weavers. That's what Krukern thinks of the building today. Rich weavers lived in Georgian houses like that, and banked at a private bank, as it was then, whose owner put his crest on top of the bank. Many a good Georgian door with fan light above it much well-wrought ironwork. Krukern seems to have delighted in ironwork two centuries ago. Houses were plain outside, but no expense and trouble spared inside. I mean, look at this staircase. The house now belongs to the local council. And as you pay your rates, I suppose, you mount these stairs and notice those well-formed triple banisters at every tread. Remember that staircase. Here's a house of about 1880. Windows getting smaller towards the top. Inside, a very plain staircase. Regency. 
depending for its effect entirely upon shape and simplicity. But Krukern must be older than what we've seen. And so it is if I look closely. Finely carved Tudor beams in this cafe. A medieval inn. But that looks Elizabethan. Krukern has been a prosperous weaving town since the Middle Ages. A Bradford of the South. And the likelihood is that a prosperous old town like this will have a large and prosperous church. And so it has. First, those iron railings. Iron so popular in Krukern in Georgian days. And then, the medieval church, built of that golden Ham Hill stone which Somerset Masons loved to carve. and a statue of St. Bartholomew, to whom the church is dedicated over the porch. A many-vistered Somerset interior. Chapel beyond chapel. Chapels built by the medieval guilds of weavers, and by big families like the Merrifields. And this curiosity. You remember that advertisement of Monkey Brand soap? with a monkey looking at its face in a glass. I'm sure it came from this brass. Outside the church is the old Krukern Grammar School, where Hardy, Nelson's flag captain, was educated. I should think that was once the headmaster's house. And even if this isn't a rectory, it looks like one. Remember, traffic is the enemy. Get off the main roads if you want to see a place. I went down this lane and found myself in the dentist's garden and saw his Regency house of cut stone, solid and satisfying. Look at the panes of the window in relation to the wall and the magnolia. Opposite was the manor house with superb 18th century wrought iron gates, some of the best anywhere. About 1760, I should think. And at the top, the crest of the Lords of the Manor, the Merrifields. I expect they built this summer house also about 1760. Plain without and, like Krukern, rich when you looked inside. It's partly a tool shed, partly a studio. What about that plaster work? This summer house looked across the peaceful garden. Now, it hears the main road. Krukern, remember Chippenham. Turn out the heavy traffic while there's still time. Sherborne lies in the Dorset Hills, in the valley of the Yeo, an abbey town of golden ironstone, an abbey whose inside is a surprise, a miracle of proportion carved out of a Norman fabric and finished in 1490. And that stone rarados I've always liked, it's Victorian. From the nave, your eye runs down the fan-vaulted roof and rests at its richest part over the choir and sanctuary. The stalls of the monks survive with medieval wooden carvings. Learning, work and concentration, and whipping. For here, on this carved monk's stall, is the truth about Sherborne. It's a town of schools. Let's go and visit them. There's been a boys' school since Saxon times. And one of the more ridiculous school songs, it isn't sung anymore now, has these words. 
When King Alfred was at Sherborne, he was just like you and me. He started at the bottom of the school. He learned his Latin grammar, and he learned his rule of three, and he sometimes played the fool. So face life cheerily, as Alfred did of old. And if you're feeling gloomy, recollect. He went through it all before, and enjoyed it, what is more. So what can you expect? What you don't expect, in an English public school, is such pleasant old buildings. That's the part of the school refounded by Edward VI in 1550, after the monastery of Sherborne had been dissolved. In the monastic school was taught St. Stephen Harding, who founded the Cistercian Order. And those are the old abbey buildings, now part of the school. The abbot's hall, now the school chapel. And on the right, the war memorial steps, built in keeping with the abbey. A Norman undercroft, where you can read the school notices. And though, thank goodness, I'm not a new boy anymore at his first term at a boarding school, sick with apprehension and longing to be back at home, yet I don't see how one could fail to be impressed by these brown ironstone buildings and to have been given a deep subconscious sense of history at the most impressionable time of my life had I been to school at Sherborne. Dark passages, mouldering walls, senior boys who seem as old as one's father, rules about where you can walk and where you can't. And then what pleasure to move out into the narrow lanes of this old-fashioned town, free at last to visit the shops, to walk with friends talking about the prospects for the next house match, makes of cars, perhaps even to notice architecture for the first time, the public conduit at the bottom of Cheap Street, where the monks used to wash. Then to walk up Cheap Street in the soft dorset air of a summertime, exams over and peace of the heart, and to notice the Georgian Bay windows above the shops, that one over the International. Sherborne, town of schools, bookshops, antique shops, tea shops, sports shops. It looks like a junior university city with every other house an old college. The merry word of the dentist drill on someone else's teeth. And here, at the top of the town, we'll leave the boys. So far, You've only seen one of the nine schools of Sherborne. I want to show you something more as we start out from this bookshop. You see those girls? Well, they shouldn't be wearing their school uniforms in the town. It's against the rules. They're pupils of Sherborne School for Girls. They should be wearing summer dresses when they go into town. It's a boarding school, you see. Uphill, in the north of Sherborne, are handsome Georgian houses, some of them owned by schools for the overflow and for staff. Let's follow our friends past these Dorset cottages, some of them converted into houses to which schoolmasters and schoolmistresses have retired unable to tear themselves away from the town of beautiful youth and high-built pavements. And there's the fine Edwardian Tower, 
and Sherborne School for Girls, surveying in golden stone its green playing fields and Celtic hills. Are these senior girls? And will they be caught, our three friends, reprimanded for being wrongly dressed in the town? No, no one has noticed. Long Street, Charlotte. These are some more schoolgirls from Lord Digby's school. And I'd like you to see the eastern part of the town with them as they walk. The Red House, Georgian red brick. And brick is rare in this stone town. 17th century cottages. And you'll notice the girls are wearing their uniforms. They're allowed to because it's a day school, Lord Digby's. After those cottages typical of much of Sherborne, here's the school itself. It now lives in this splendid 18th century mansion of the Portman family, who used it as a halfway home between their Somerset and Dorset properties. Now just notice those stairs, and particularly those treads. They're in inlaid wood. The crest of the Portmans in Walnut and Sycamore. And when we get to the top of the stairs, there's another surprise. The whole of the wall of the staircase hall are painted by Sir James Thornhill, who painted the inside of the dome of St. Paul's Cathedral in London. He was Hogarth's father-in-law. In the art school at Lord Digby's, I'd like you to look at the picture this girl is painting. It's our farewell to Sherborne, the town of youth and the town of age. That picture is of the almshouse of St. John the Baptist and St. John the Evangelist. It's still there near the entrance to Sherborne Abbey, and it's been there for 500 years. It was founded by King Henry VI, for 12 local men and for four local women. And here they live with their memories of the Dorset of Thomas Hardy. Rhyme Intrinsica, Fontmel Magna, Sturminster, Newton and Mulberry Bub. And there the screen divides the dining hall in the chapel. And here's the prior elected by the brethren who's ringing the bell. The treasure of the chapel is the Flemish triptych of the 14th century. Sherborne bells for life's early morning. A bell for the sunset. Sidmouth looked a hundred years ago. Still much the same, it lies these hills below. Still the old church tower rises in the trees. But this quaint house's windows, what are these? They're bits of church saved from extermination by the Victorian so-called restoration.
still in the shadow of the tower repose neath handsome Georgian headstones bones of those who built their mansions in this countryside who came for health bathed quietly here and died. Pause at this altar tomb, where you can see, sculptured, the name of Mr. Edward Lee. And there's his house in 1823. And here it is today. The change is small, since George III was monarch of us all. Mansions for admirals by the Pebbly Strand. And cottages for maiden aunts in land that go with tea and strawberries and cream. Sweet sheltered gardens by the twisting stream, cob thatch and fuchsia bells, a Devon dream. Yon Gothic castle is the royal glen. Princess Victoria, a baby then, played with her mother in this garden green, and Sidmouth nurtured England's future queen. Why am I talking to this film in rhyme? It suits the film. It suits the sunny climb. It rolls with leisured ease these streets along. It does to this verandered world belong. Gothic or classic, terrace or hotel, here does the backbone of old England dwell. Men who have served this country all their lives. Mothers who smile to see their daughter's wives. From yonder balcony, what eyes look down on some young lover strolling in the town? And from this road, what eyes have looked above to yon bay window with this light of love? Here, with what happiness could I return and watch my own flame dying, love's young fire? See when the sun is at its noonday height. Regency ironwork, elegant and light. It stands out grim against the stucco's white. Broad crescents basking in the summer sun. A sense of sea and holidays begun. Leisure to live and breathe and smell and look. Unfold for me this seaside history book. And when the architecture grows more slack, among the little houses at the back, stucco recedes. Victorian bricks appear in Alma Terrace, shades of the Crimea. Lunchtime is over. Now the hour for rest, and snores are gentle as the sun moves west. In summer silence, bricks and blossoms swoon, all on the drowsy Sidmouth afternoon. Clocks in a hundred houses chime three. It's time to saunter to the town for tea, to exercise the dog and have a chat on this and this and that and that. Two and eleven. My goodness, what a price. Now don't go there, dear. Do take my advice. Oh, everything is dearer now, I fear. Do you find dear things so much dearer, dear? Well, I, you know, must think before I buy. My pension's tiny and my rent is high. Now, wait two minutes, dear. Wait to shop at homes here and buy myself a chop. You don't mind waiting. Well, then watch the meat. I won't take long my purchase to complete. Or go to Selix just across the street. I'll meet you there. I want to buy some paint. I love these Sidmouth shopping streets. So quaint. Oh, I must tell you, dear, you used to know that corner cupboard where I like to show my old crown derby. Well, it had to go. Ah, times must change, and Sidmouth changes too. If they did not, what would antique shops do?
since I have had to hold my purse strings tight. Shop window gazing is my chief delight. Look, there's a real feature of the place, that dear old shop which sells the Devon lace. That dear old lady there is quite the same. I'm getting old too, I forget her name. It's time that I was going home to tea. Come to the front. Come, dear, with me. I'd simply love to. There's a glimpse of sea. And on the front, as Sidmouth tea time ends, there's always such a chance of meeting friends. Uncle and Auntie Gladys, what a treat. So this is Terence, doesn't he look sweet? Well, weren't us lucky, all of us, to meet. As the waves thunder on the shingle shore, the wife and I lie back and have a snore. As the waves thunder on the shingle shore, I like to hear this pebbly backwash roar, and I lift my eyes to see the sunlight, those Georgian cottages with roofs of thatch. I like to stand upon the esplanade and look across to where some earthquake moved millions of years ago those cliffs of red. Bay beyond bay, from sandstone head to head. Then to watch cricket on the fairest ground, that ring which exists all England round. And although cricket bores me, here I find the pleasant scenery, I ease my mind. Sun-smitten terrace, sound of ball on bat, and in the quiet, the sudden cry, how's that? The keen sea air so keeps my brain awake that even I can some interest take, and if on cricket, I would turn my back to watch the wood go rolling to the jack. Well, Here's the game that Devon used to play on Plymouth Hove 400 years away. Sunset and Sidmouth. Sad, I say farewell. To your warm, shallow vale where I would dwell beyond that red Edwardian hotel. Pause on Peak Hill. Look eastward to the town. Then to the Connaught Gardens wander down, and in the shelter of its tropic bowers, I see its bright and outsized Devon flowers. Farewell, seductive Sidmouth by the sea, older and more exclusive than Torquay. Sidmouth in Devon, you're the town for me.
here I am by the west front of Bath Abbey. It's a splendid building, but it doesn't quite fit in to the picture we're going to show you of Bath, and I'll tell you why. When they built Bath Abbey in the Middle Ages, they were Christians who built it, and I'm sure that they thought that any Roman remains that might have been lying about were terrible pagan haunted things. And then in the 18th century, when Bath water became a fashionable cure and people went to the Roman bath, ancient Rome was greatly admired and they tried to build here in Bath a new Rome of splendid stone buildings. And Handel, who played the organ here in Bath Abbey, his music seems to go well with the architecture of Georgian Bath. So we're going to have a sequence to his water music and royal fireworks suite of the city of Bath, starting with a uh, water sequence with the river and the canal and the gardens, then through the houses where the fashionable people stayed, into the shops and ending on the grand sweep of the crescents up on these Somerset hills that surround us. But I think music, even more than words, will be able to show you the beauty of Bath. <laughs> 